Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for our final event in the New York City Reborn Virtual Summit. Today's panel uh, is called An Education Playbook for the Next Mayor. I'm Andy Smarrick, and I'm a senior fellow here at the Manhattan Institute. I'm going to be moderating today. And in just a moment, I'm going to introduce our fantastic panel. But first, I just wanted to spend literally a minute or less probably talking about the idea behind this event, why we're doing this one. Now, K-12 education is always going to be important to a mayoral election. School quality and family contentment with a uh, city's public school system and private school system, that influences everything from home prices to in and out migration to economic development, a sense of whether or not there's real opportunity in the city. So regardless of the time, regardless of the year, regardless of the city, um, schools are always going to be important. But this time around, especially in New York City, things are even, well, uh, things are more pronounced, the need to focus on K-12 education. Um, and that's because of the conditions and because of the direction of the Big Apple schools over the past number of years. The next leader really needs to head into classrooms, how we're gonna make up for learning losses, how we're going to expand and improve school options. And uh, more generally, for those of us who care about the city's schools, uh, how do we return New York City's schools to its rightful place as honestly a national leader in urban school reform generally? So we are here to discuss the state of the city schools and what the next mayor should prioritize, both in terms of leadership and practices and policies. We're going to do away with opening statements and just try to get right into the conversation. I have some questions ready to go, and I'm going to use those to just make sure that we get the ball rolling. But I think this conversation is going to move on its own volition. These topics are interesting enough on their own, and our panelists are superb. But if all of you watching right now have any particular questions uh, uh, or thoughts along the way, I encourage you, as soon as the spirit moves you, use that chat function, send in a question, send in a comment. I'm going to be monitoring that over the next hour, and I won't save things until the very end. If there's something particularly interesting or a point someone wants to make or dive in, send me that question, and I will get those questions into the bloodstream as quickly as possible. All right, so now on to our wonderful panelists. Today we're joined by Wei Wa Chin. She's the president of the Chinese American Citizens Alliance of Greater New York. Next is Kathleen Porter McGee. She is the superintendent of Partnership Schools, a network of seven urban Catholic schools in Harlem and the South Bronx. She's also a senior visiting fellow at the Thomas B. Fordham Institute, and she authored a terrific report for MI, the Manhattan Institute, um, Catholic on the Inside, Putting Values Back at the Center of Education Reform. And last but certainly not least, Ian Rowe. He's a resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. He focuses on education and other related topics. He's also a co-founder of the brand new Vertex Partnership Academies. It's a new network of character-based high schools that uh, will be opening up in the Bronx in 2022, so next fall. He was also the CEO of Public Prep, a famous um, high-performing nonprofit network of charter schools based in the South Bronx and Manhattan. So sincere thanks to all of you for your willingness to participate in this. I think we're going to have a great conversation. Uh, let's set the context first, if you don't mind. So for each of you, what is your assessment of the direction of K-12 schooling in New York City over the past eight years? Um, how have things been going? Let's use that as a way to um, set the, the groundwork for future conversations. So Weiwa, do you want to begin? Where do you see schools right now in the city? Uh, thank you uh, very much for inviting me as uh, the founding president of Cacagni. Uh, we've been looking at the public schools as a key part of the entire community. Is This is a necessary for the continuation of the strength of the city, but in the last eight years, uh, things have not been going in the right direction. If you ask parents, if you ask educators, not educrats, but educators, are you better off, are the students better off today than they were eight years ago, even before COVID? I think the resounding answer would be, no, they are not as well off now, even pre-COVID, and certainly much worse after uh, COVID uh, than they were eight years ago. So I think that this is a time that we've got to change and run to catch up, to catch up to fix a lot of the problems, to and increase the performance and focus on the children, on the children and not the adults here. So um, that's my assessment. And we've got to think about 
and returning excellence into the classrooms. We have to get the uh, educrats out of the classrooms. We have to uh, get the best practices uh, in place. And we have to make sure that merit for all of our students is taken care of, that we do not discriminate against children, particularly as somebody who is representing not just um, all, all the students of, of New York and the parents, but I, I have a particular interest in the Asian community, and the Asian community is under attack here because you see it in the screen schools, you see it in the different you know, talented, you see it in the specialized high schools, when again and again they tell the Asians that they are too many in these schools. That actually affects them every single day. It affects them outside of the school too. When we talk about the hate crimes, we talk about the crimes against Asians, when you are told that you are discriminated against and it is okay in the schools, it will go to the streets and it will hurt us physically as well as deprive us of the rights to the education that is deserved. Thank you, Wei. Well, we're going to come back to a number of those topics uh, over the next um, hour. So thanks for kicking, up, uh, kicking us off. Kathleen, do you want to go next? Sure. Um, I, I mean, I agree that I don't think uh, New York has been headed in the right direction in the past eight years for a number of reasons. I think that if we're, I, I know that the de Blasio administration espouses the rhetoric of, of equity, but if you actually look at the policies and practices and the outcomes that we've seen over the past eight years in New York, I feel like what we're doing in the city is working at cross purposes of achieving that goal. So just like tacking through a couple of different things over the past eight years, we've seen growing um, opt out of, of uh, state testing. And, and that's particularly being driven, I think, in New York City itself. So we're seeing reduced transparency. We're getting less and less of an idea of how well our public schools are serving, especially the most vulnerable students. We're seeing choice really stagnating. The, the charter growth has obviously ground to a halt with the charter cap, but also at the same time, and something that's near and dear to my heart, particularly over the past eight years, you've seen dozens of, of Catholic schools, particularly urban Catholic schools that serve our most vulnerable New York City communities that have closed. And that continues to to hurt uh, New York City as a whole, but particularly our most vulnerable communities within the city. And then meanwhile, I think over the past you know, year plus, if you look at how COVID has, has been handled and how it's impacted the city broadly, but particularly the city schools, I think it's really exposed a lot of vulnerabilities. You've got this really massive public school bureaucracy and they perhaps predictably have struggled to to kind of nimbly respond to what kids and community needs. And I think the combination of all of those things together, a reduction in transparency and accountability, a reduction in, in parent choice, particularly in our most vulnerable communities, and then a large bureaucracy that really struggles to, to adapt to meet the changing needs of our communities. And I think the outcomes are, are gonna be devastating if we don't see a change in, in trajectory and a change of pace. Thank you. Ian, thoughts? Oh, uh, well, thank you, Andy. And I, I very much agree with my colleagues, uh, Kathleen and Weiwa. I mean, it, it feels like in New York City, after the eight years, we're limping to the finish line uh, in terms of coming to de Blasio's, the end of his tenure. I mean, consider we have a chancellor, Carranza, who's leaving, honestly, with a pretty dismal record of achievement. Uh, as Kathleen just said, we have a COVID situation where New York City schools did not handle uh, the, the crisis well. We have continued opposition to charter schools, despite the fact uh, that there is, uh, despite the fact that charter schools continue to provide an incredible option, particularly in low-income communities with long uh, wait lists. We've, as, as Weiwa says, we have attacks on specialized high schools going after the best uh, schools in terms of equity and actually not identifying the real issues with what's going on in K to eight that would improve the outcomes uh, for kids uh, to be able to then compete on an equal playing field to get into some of the higher performing high schools. You know, and and I'll, I'll highlight de Blasio's sig you know, signature initiative, which we all tend to sort of forget but in 2014, you know, Mayor de Blasio announced the Renewal Initiative, that there were 94 struggling schools in New York City, 
It was a lot of fanfare. We were going to invest a lot of money. $773 million. $773 million in 94 renewal schools. Much fanfare, lots of press releases. Five years later, it quietly came to an end. Where did that money go? It was more than $8 million per school. And the, the, rec the, the results are dismal. And so there's the, if you're interested, you should read the post-mortem report. The single biggest finding of the renewal program that we had to spend $773 million to discover was, quote, one of the most significant findings of the renewal program is the importance of a strong principle, end quote. That was the light bulb after spending $773 million. The New York Times said, quote, city officials had known some of these 94 renewal schools were likely to fail, but had left most of them open anyway. As a result, officials essentially kept thousands of children in classrooms where they had little, if any, chance of thriving, end quote. To me, I think we've got to remember these massive investments that are just pure waste, that mayors and other leaders get credit on the press releases, but quiet uh, exits when they demonstrate failure and don't help children. So I'm really hopeful that the next mayor has a much more focused on agenda on what actually works for kids. Well, let's well, thank you for that. And let's just spend one more beat on this question, because coming into office, uh, Mayor de Blasio, it seemed like equity was the word that he used the most, both during his campaign and then like early on in the administration. And I was never quite sure what that meant. Uh, I was worried what it would mean is trying to stop school choice, trying to spend as much money as possible on these kind of like big ticket item like items like you talked about, like this renewal program. Um, and I'm not sure that the system is more equitable today if we're talking about more and more kids being better served, more options being tailored to the needs of families, families feeling comfortable with it. So um, equity, I assume, is going to continue to be a, a buzzword uh, in these kinds of circles. But is there a way to think differently uh, to operationalize equity differently so we don't have another eight years worth of stagnant results and sort of programming that seemed like it was more from 1970 than 2010 or 2020. Any thoughts? Well, you know, I, I, I'm much more focused on equality of opportunity. So if, for example, in the Bronx, where the, in the schools that we led uh, for 10 years in District 8, you know, in 2015, if you were a student that started at a high school in ninth grade, four years later, only 2% graduated from high school ready for college. Meaning that you started ninth grade and you either dropped out over the course of four years, or you actually did earn your high school diploma, but you still couldn't do basic reading nor math without remediation if you actually went to a community college. So, and if you're in that neighborhood, your uh, sentence to go to the same school that has been uh, failing that community for generations. So that's equality of opportunity is giving those parents and those students in that neighborhood a chance. We can't get to whatever the definition of equity is if we're not starting with equality of opportunity, meaning every child should have access to a great tuition-free public school regardless of race, class, or income level. Yeah, Waywa, uh, I mean, does the community that you represent, do they feel like the last eight years have been equitable for them? And what would you like the next eight years to look like? Uh, I, I want to take that buzzword equity and turn it on its head. Because the, the way equity is being spoken about is not about real true equity or equal opportunity or equal rights, which is the most important thing. We have to remember that the most important thing that the government should be doing is striving for equal rights. Because if you, but instead, the government is trying to go and look for equal outcomes. And that's not possible. It is impossible and immoral to get equal outcomes for everybody. Because you can only strive to give them as Ian said, the, the chance. Everybody gets the equal chance, the equal rights to them, something. But you cannot say that a person who is born 
six feet tall is going to be the same as somebody who's born to be three feet tall. It just doesn't happen that way. And so we have to take, though, for each person to strive and make them the best. And that is what is important. So looking at equity to say what is right for all of the kids and also for the society, we have to make sure that we encourage the most important channel to equity, which is giving them a good education. When you lie to your students and say you are all passing when they have not learned the basics of reading, writing, and arithmetic, that is dooming them to inequity. But you have to fix that education path so that they have good math skills, good reading and writing skills, good thinking analytical skills, and that is the first and most important route to equity. And then you could get into the other aspects of uh, getting to college, getting to jobs, and getting into the, the different kinds of, uh, kinds of jobs and professions that people will need in the next century. So that's where I see equity must be and not in judging people by their skin color. When we see that schools, opportunities that should be grown across the board, the, the screen schools, the gifted and talented, those disappeared from a lot of the black and Hispanic neighborhoods. They used to be there growing a lot of students very well. And then when they all disappeared, you found naturally less prepared kids. And that's wrong. It's in those neighborhoods that need the most support where these disappeared. And we should be thinking in those terms of get, growing those opportunities everywhere, not shrinking them, because that's exactly what they're doing. They're getting rid of the gifted and the talented and getting rid of the screen schools and trying to suppress also the specialized high school. It should be the opposite direction of trying to see how do we grow them so that we can have uh, people of any color, uh, any, if we talk about diversity, it should be diversity of, uh, all your interests and achievements as well as color. Color is one of them, but remember, we are diverse in many ways. That is the definition of diversity, isn't it, folks? And so we have to get back to that and make sure that we treat that equity problem by getting back to excellence, ac academic rigor, and giving them the values to focus on that kind of studying and growth that is needed for this city and the individuals. Kathleen, would think, you, yeah, please. Yeah, I mean, I amplify everything that, that uh, my colleagues have said. I think that equality of opportunity is really important. And I think the challenge is that the way equity is being used right now, not just in New York City, but I think in pockets around the country, is actually about limiting opportunity for all. So rather than trying to like be a rising tide that lifts all boats, we're, we're looking, and I think about that in terms of the specialized high school and eliminating um, basically saying that, you know, we want to, we, rather than allowing a meritocracy to figure out who gets in by a test base, which we know is a more equitable way, if you're looking at opportunity to admit students into a specialized high school, we're looking to, to have other, whether it's quotas or something else. I, th I was thinking about this the other day too. You have in, in Virginia, the news I think came out just yesterday about the state saying nobody can have accelerated math until seventh yeah. grade. I don't know if you guys heard about this. Again, yeah. in the name of equity. So again, rather than trying to figure out how do we increase opportunity for, for communities that have been locked out, we're looking to actually decrease opportunity for everybody. And I think that's a huge mistake. I think we absolutely need to be looking at unlocking opportunity and lifting all boats. I think the second thing as well, the reason and way why I, com I completely agree with you and you say, we can't move towards a quality of outcome for lots of reasons, including that you can't prescribe what every parent wants for their child in terms of an outcome. So like there, there's just no way in a free society to say we want to have a quality of outcome. And so therefore we're going to dictate what that outcome is. You have to allow some freedom of choice and some freedom of opportunity within that frame. Yeah, it's such a great point. This is, uh, I think, part and parcel of the, just the mindset change between like a single government monopoly and a choice-based system. Uh, in the latter, you have to recognize that different parents in different communities have different priorities or they rank order things differently. And what they think of as the good life may be a bit different. And there's no way a single 
cookie cutter uh, system of education that gives everyone the same thing no matter what can make everybody happy. And so this then leads to this question of, uh, in the previous administrations, there seemed to be just an understanding that charters were a good thing because they provided options and the private schools community was valuable because it gave these other kinds of options. Um, I don't want to put words in the current administration's mouth, but they just seemed a whole lot less um, uh, they didn't like that idea that a robust uh, private school sector and a charter sector um, could add to educational opportunity. I think they viewed equity as having to come through the system itself. So as you start to think about what equal opportunity looks like, what does what should the new mayor and his or her uh, chancellor be thinking about in terms of policies and practice and even posture, just public messaging when it comes to opportunity in different types of schools and parental choice and differentiation? That's open to any of you. Well, I, I guess, oh, sorry, Ian, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say, I think that one thing is just for the mayor and the superintendent, like it's for the mayor, excuse me, and the chancellor to think of themselves not as stewards of a public school system, but as as kind of servant leaders for all children who live within the city. And I think that's the biggest challenge right now, whether you have um, large urban district superintendents or in, in the case of New York and other cities that have mayoral control, if they think of their job only in terms of the one particular system rather than in serving all students, I think that frame leads yep. to policies that that lock families out and and that end up hurting, honestly, that end up hurting your own constituents in the end. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, one of the one of the aspects of COVID uh, and the fact that you know an entire city was forced to suddenly parents all became homeschoolers is that parents suddenly had much greater visibility into what their kids were learning. And they saw their schools either opening up well or not opening up well, or how they handled hybrid learning. You had some schools, a lot of charters and Catholic schools like Kathleen's that were highly attentive, really aggressively having, you know, synchronous instruction. Other schools was asynchronous, asynchronous, um, you know, uh, paper. There was no accountability and very little learning. And so I think the next mayor has to recognize that more parents are gonna want more choice, not less. They're gonna want to see, wow, well, if, if my school is not opening well or they're not doing it safely or they're, they're, they're just not prepared, I want the ability to choose the best option for my kids. So I actually think this is now even going beyond the traditional argument for choice, which is really focused on low-income kids for which there's already a strong argument for choice, but the the, the remnants of COVID, I think hopefully a an attentive mayor uh, can see that, you know, and, and I'll say this, I, I'm a product of the New York City public school system. I went to Brooklyn Tech, I, you know, but my parents, you know, they, 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 they really thought about their options and, and they felt gratified that they, you know, A, I was able to get in, but B, that they had this option. And to be an administration that continues to send the signal that regardless of the options in front of you, you're relegated to this choice is I think gonna perpetuate the negative aspects of what de Blasio has done for the last eight years. Okay, so I wanna to transition to COVID in just one second. Um, uh, but let me first encourage everyone watching, please use that chat function to send in some questions. We already have a few that I'm going to get in, uh, but whatever you think is important, make sure you let us know so we can direct the conversation to your interests. Okay, so no one could have predicted uh, a year's worth of pandemic and uh, a big city school system trying to figure out what in the world to do with it and how to keep teachers and kids safe and do hybrid and, and so on. What we probably know at this point, probably, is that a whole lot of kids have lost some learning, whether that's three months, six months, nine months, a year or more, and which demographic groups are going to suffer the most is still to be determined. Uh, but unquestionably, if not the top responsibility, I think, of the next school leader will be how do we get back to some new normal or um, something even better than that? So how should the next mayor and the next chancellor start to think about what post-COVID looks like? Are we talking about tutoring, longer school days, more school choice, some sort of um, uh, voucher ESA type program that allows families to pick different types of options? How do we get over this most unusual year that's going to leave even more kids behind? 
Uh, that's a good question with uh, the extra hours. Extra hours as well as summer school is all in the discussion. Uh, there are lots of kids who have basically not gone to school because all you have to do in a lot of the public schools is just log in yeah. briefly and you're considered to be present. That is ridiculous. That is not an education. And we have to really compensate for a lot of lost learning. Now, before you start on that, though, I should mention that we have to deal with the issue of crime and safety of our students. Our students are concerned, a lot of them, not just about the COVID. In fact, most of them are not concerned about COVID because uh, the schools that have opened, the kids have not been getting sick. You have not found that a lot of cases are happening. But it's much more that I have heard that people are concerned about the uh, problems getting back and forth to school and the school safety agents, whether they are going to be a part of the solution or they're going to be just disappear. You, you can't do that and have kids going to school concerned about their personal safety. So that's one of the key things that you have to start with for COVID and then work on trying to get the extra hours and the, the real uh, focus on trying to get back into real curriculums, not fake tests because we've just had a bout of the state test. I don't know whether you know about it, but it was a farce because they basically gave kids the exam. Mm -hmm. Inconceivable, you know, you know, you know, you know, it's, it's, you, you had tests that were already not just given before, so the kids knew the answer. They were from several years earlier, in fact. So if you were eighth grader, you were taking a sixth grade test. And so that would of course inflate the, a performance, the grade of the kids, and you could say, well, they all passed. That is not an education. That is just a magician's trick. The level of cynicism in that is unbelievable. Mm -hmm. And who's going to be held accountable for that? So Kathleen, you, um, uh, again, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you, I think your schools were pretty forward leaning on saying, we're going to get our doors open as soon as possible. And you took a stand on that. And I think by fall of this year, you were like, your doors were open and a lot of your families came back. So what lessons learned do you have from opening up quickly, staying open, dealing with um, families and kids who have concerns, and then the lingering learning effects of all of that. And then if you want to add on a statement that's near and dear to my heart, this thing about should we be do doing testing right now? Should we put off state testing? Um, how do we get the information necessary so we can do the follow-up and uh, dealing with the learning loss if we don't have the information? But first, maybe walk us through what you've learned about actually running schools in person in a city where most schools were closed. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think the biggest thing is that you have to open in order to in order to build uh, trust and faith in, an, in a reopening plan. You actually have to just kind of you you have to lead. You have you have to kind of put your money where your mouth is, and you have to open. And I give credit. So we did open all seven of our New York schools and our two Cleveland schools, but we weren't the only ones. If you actually look at the data, it's amazing. It was something like ninety two percent of Catholic schools nationwide open for in person instruction on the first day of school this year for some in-person instruction, um, compared to I think 43% of traditional public schools and 34% of charter schools. And some of that is because we feel very directly accountable to, to our families and to our parents. So we just had to find a way, especially yeah. I know for our New York City families, we have you know children of essential workers. They didn't have daycare, they didn't have an option, they didn't have, you know, the luxury of, of, of space in their house for children to learn safely. So we just had to figure it out. So some of it is that you just need to find a way. Um, and I know that might sound easier said than done, but but there is a way, like where there's a will, there is a way. So we did, you know, starting, uh, you know, the Tuesday after Labor Day, we opened for in-person instruction. We followed the CDC guidelines. First, what we did was we surveyed all of our families to find out who would come back for in-person and who would stay home. So we had some sense of the capacity challenges that we would face. We obviously had to make use of every single square inch of our <laughs> campus and i'm going to say campus i use that don't picture like a university campus i mean like we had 
um, tents on uh, even some public playground space that's adjacent to some of our schools in New York City so that we could have outdoor classes, so that we could have make sure that all kids had recess every day so they had the opportunity to run around and, and be children. Um, we made sure in all of our buildings that had windows that opened that they could all open enough to kind of keep air circulating. We added fans in the two schools where we actually do have air conditioning systems. We improved kind of the filtration and air. So we, we went, we basically just took the CDC guidelines in the fall and we figured out a way to make them a reality in our, in our schools and in our classrooms. Um, or I should say the CDC or the AAP. So starting actually in the fall, I know there's a big debate right now about whether kids should be six feet apart or three feet, three feet apart. We actually, since the fall have been following the American Association of Pediatrics guidelines of three feet. So we guaranteed three feet of space and not six feet because it would it just would have been impossible to, to open any classrooms if you had to have six feet. Um, we did put the, the, uh, the barriers on the desks, which now seems like maybe it wasn't necessary, but we didn't know that at the time. So we made the investment in them. So essentially it was, you know, you know, where there's a will, there's a way. It was, you know, following, while we didn't know everything, we knew something and it was following the guidance of experts and figuring out a way to, to do it. Um, and then it was, it was really about, I mean, we, I met with every single, you know, teacher who wanted to within our network and talked to them about our reopening plan to get their feedback on it. It was acknowledging and addressing the fear they felt. Cause, you know, think about it. This was August, 2020. We didn't know what it was going to look like. Now we know we have the benefit of hindsight to know that we were able to do this safely. We knew that we were going to do the best that we could, but we did not know what it was going to look like. So it was meeting with our teachers and saying, like, I hear your fear. I, I respect it. I understand it. Let's work this out together. And then I think the last thing was just having clear um, regular communication with everybody in the community. So we made the commitment to every you know, parent and to every family member, to every faculty member, that the minute we heard about any COVID exposure, we would communicate that right away to everybody. And it gave the spirit, I mean, Catholic schools, I think are communities first and foremost. And so we kind of starting in the spring of 2020, we had this, we're all in this together mindset. And we just tried to, to kind of build that trust by being honest about what we knew and what we didn't know and, and keeping the, the communication clear. Um, and it's been a challenge. I mean, again, I'm really proud that we've been open since the fall, but it's, I think all of, I think all of our pandemic principals are very, very excited for this summer. It's been a really hard year, I think, to be a, to be a school leader. Um, but to the second point in terms of stemming learning loss, I think it's been essential. Um, we are huge proponents of using external assessments to benchmark our own progress. We, I basically lost faith. We typically do take the New York State test. Catholic schools in the Archdiocese of New York have taken the New York State test for years and years. Um, and we have at, at the partnership for many years. This year, I kind of lost confidence that the state was going to do what they needed to. And as, as you guys both just said, last week showed that the New York has not really made a commitment to rigorous, transparent um, assessments that are going to give us a clear picture into student learning loss. So beginning in January, we adopted a different external assessment so we could start to benchmark our own students' learning loss, um, you know, in real time this year. So I think that is essential. I think there's no way to serve students well over the long term if you don't know where they are today. That's great. Um, if you don't mind, I want to make this as practical as possible. Um, I bet a lot of the people watching this just want to know what should the next leaders do? And so I want to tick down like a set of issues. And if you have thoughts on them, please let us know. If you just want to take a pass, that's fine as well. I just want to make sure that we hit some of these particular uh, policy domi domains and leadership domains so the folks watching um, know what a leader of the new system ought to do. So the first is actually about the leader, him or herself. So there will be a mayor. And then that mayor gets to choose a chancellor. As all of you think about what a great chancellor for the next four years, eight years ought to look like, what experiences he or she should have, just general posture on issues, what are you looking for? What would make you excited in the next chancellor? Weiwa, do you want to go first? Well, I'm going to go and first thank the uh, 
parochial schools, the Catholic schools, and the private schools, and the charter schools for being a beacon to the public schools. Because they have shown that you can open, you can teach, even in a pandemic. Uh, I think that, that is, that's part of what a new chancellor should do, is look at best practices in other systems. We have to remember that a lot of the students in New York are not public school kids and the traditional ones. They're in the charter schools, which is public, but it's charter schools. They're in private schools. They're in parochial schools. And all of them have done a lot better. The paroch I know a lot of parents who have gone and taken their kids out of the public school system and put them in parochial schools. I do not know the other direction. It's not happening in the other direction. So a good new chancellor should be thinking about best practices, get rid of this provinciality of saying that we're going to try to do it just public school route and with all the jargon that comes with it and really focus back on the children. And we have to look for somebody who is not going to be divisive. Carranza was incredibly divisive to talk about diversity, 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 and talk about equity, 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 and inclusion, inclusion without thinking about what we should be doing in instruction is a disaster. You have to have somebody who will focus on that, bring back accountability at the local levels too. The principals have been burdened, and I've talked to principals, they have been burdened in the last eight years with a lot of micromanagement, but not accountability in the education of children. So there's micromanaging, you have to go and check a lot of little boxes. You have to worry more about your students learning what their pronoun is without knowing what a noun is or an article. You're too busy telling them, are you gonna be a she, her, hers, as opposed to what do those mean? And not only that, the kid changes their mind in five months and the whole class has to go and cha change the way you address a kid. You know, if, if that's a waste of learning time. We should be focusing on that. And so we, we have somebody who's innovative, who can think about how do you bring back education into the classroom to focus not on the levels and levels of administration, because while the last eight years, the Blasio you know, spent lots of money in bringing in additional levels of supervision. That is not good. We should be spending the money in educating the kids. So that's one of the things that I would like to see a new chancellor do. Think about how do I concentrate back and on the classroom, uh, get back instruction, stop the divisive types of learning, uh, indoctrination. I think Ian used that word, right? Uh, and and uh, we have to go back to the parochial schools that Kathleen has shown works very well. And Ian, I've said before, we need charter schools also for Asians, okay? You know, there, there aren't any. And so we want more of those. They're not being served. And uh, we know that they're working for your, in your very poor neighborhoods, the charter schools. We should be learning that and replicating that throughout so that you don't have uh, a, a, a big divide between how the kids are learning. Thank you. Uh, Ian, thoughts on the next uh, chancellor, what he or she should prioritize, what kind of background and so on? Well, I, I'll double down on everything Weiwa just said. I mean, you know, basically I want a mayor and a chancellor that doesn't operate on press releases and instead they operate on evidence and results. And, you know, I mean, it, Weiwa just said it so well, we have lots of pockets of excellence throughout the city, including district schools, charter schools, uh, Catholic schools. So we there is a roadmap for replication. What the what the mayor and the chancellor have to do is to create an environment so that there can be replication. At this very moment, today, right now, if you had the great idea to build a school that takes the best practices from everything, from the best charter schools, from the best Catholic schools, and you wanted to create a new charter in the heart of the South Bronx, you couldn't do it. There is a cap, right? If you wanted to build another fantastic high school that could compete with Stuyvesant and Brooklyn Tech, you couldn't do it. So we need, because of this cap, and so we need a chancellor that's not scared to go against the union and go against all the forces 
that are holding choice back for kids. They focus not on press releases. We're going to spend $773 million to, to support 94 struggling schools. Five years later, out with a whimper, right? and the money is gone. We need courageous leadership. That's what Kathleen just, that's what she just represented. You have a mindset that says we can achieve, our kids can achieve. So then the conversation becomes about how we do it, not if we do it. Okay, so um, one thing I should put in parentheses uh, and I wanna come back to is Kathleen schools are unionized. They're Catholic schools, but it doesn't mean that uh, like in most other places at all private schools are non-unionized. So this is a battle that she's fought. So let's come to that in a second, but let's focus in on this charter school question for a second because many folks watching may not actually know that New York City was a hotbed of education entrepreneurialism when it came to charter schools 20 years ago, 15 years ago. I mean, success academies and KIPP and, um, uh, and public, prep. Uh, public <laughs> prep and achievement first, um, uncommon schools, like they were doing remarkable things. And now, as you just said, if you want to start a new school, you're going to at minimum be hindered for a while. There's a cap. So what would all of you say to the next mayor or chancellor? What can those leaders do to enable uh, charter growth and charter excellence to expand again? One, we should lift the cap. Yeah, we should lift the cap. So, <laughs> so, you, you so, explain, cap. so explain what that is. So that is a state level, state legislative cap, or is that something done by the district administration? Well, what's interesting, it is at the state level, but the cap is actually so. There's a there's a statewide number of available charters, but mm -hmm. right now they're distributed geographically, and New York City has hit its limit or its cap. I think there are about a hundred charters outside of New York State, I mean, outside of New York City that are open and for to compete. So at the least what could happen, even if right now we didn't have, have the whole battle to increase the overall cap, how about just eliminating the geographic restriction? So that would then mean any charter school leader in New York City could at least have the opportunity to compete. Once again, back to this idea, no one's handing you a charter. You have equality of opportunity. You have to demonstrate that you're gonna build a fantastic school. And we're not even allowed that. Like the, the, the contradiction between equity, we want equity and not even allowing talented people to have the opportunity to build great schools. You're not even given a shot to do that, to compete on an equal playing field. It's, hip, it's, it's hypocritical. And again, we need a mayor and a chancellor who have courage to stand up to the forces that stop equality of opportunity for kids. And I would say that we should have that in the public schools as well as charter schools, more oh, yes. charter school choice. And then in the same thing with the public schools, we should have more gifted and talented, more screen schools, and more specialized high schools. You know, there's no reason why it should be a scarce group when we could create it. It's not like you have to go and mine in some uh, South African gold mine and it's limited, but here you can create it. Uh, Kathleen, do you want to weigh in on that or this question of unions? Because this is what we're getting a lot in the chat. Like, aren't unions the ultimate barrier to any kind of reform? You've actually dealt with a union for years and you got open schools um, even through negotiations. So what do you have to say about that? Uh, so the only thing I would add to, to what Ian and, and, um, was saying about expanding expanding choice is I would add, I would love to see anybody within the the you know, mayor's office or the chancellor's office starting to th at least talk positively about tax credits or some mm. sort of public support yeah. for private education, whether it's through tax credits or, or schol direct scholarships. I know that that's a third rail in, in New York City and New York State. It should not be, particularly if we care about equity. Again, if you look at parochial schools have opened up, have been serving our most vulnerable when no other schools have, or very few other schools in the city have been this year. And yet they, ha you know, families have to scrape together something to, to make that happen. So so that's the only thing that I would add to 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 the previous discussion. Yeah, on the and union, I agree with that. 
Um, on the union side, our schools are unionized. All the Catholic school teachers in the Archdiocese of New York are part of the Federation for Catholic Teachers, which is a, a Catholic school teachers union that's independent. Um, so, I mean, it's different, right? Obviously, it's a different union than the, the UFT, the AFT, or the NEA. Um, it is a union that I think understands um, the unique position that Catholic schools are in and that urban Catholic schools are in particularly. I mean, obviously, if you are a union head supporting teachers in schools, um, dozens of which have closed in the last eight years alone, you're going to come to the table differently, frankly. You're not... Your future, the future of your members is not guaranteed through public support. And so I, I think that that changes the conversation, which is why I'm such a, I mean, if I were going to attack anything, I, I think I would attack school choice before I'd attack unionization because I don't, I think unionization is a proxy problem. I think the problem is that parents don't have equal voice to the, to the unions right now. So when you say attack school choice, you mean like make this a priority in terms of yes. charters and um, some sort of ESA or tax credit program? Yeah, absolutely. Like expand, I should say. Attack that as an issue. Expand it. Uh, get, essentially, it's about empowering parents. I think right now, and this is what we saw in COVID, part of the reason that schools remain closed is that parents don't have an equal seat at the table unless they have the autonomy and the, and the sort of financial wherewithal to vote with their feet. And in places where we've seen that happen, we did see public school enrollments drop, you know, fairly dramatically. But again, it's always like it always is our most vulnerable communities where parents don't have that agency unless they have access to the power of the purse that comes in the form of a tax credit, a voucher of some sort of scholarship support. Very good. Let me just do one more pitch to the people watching. If you have any other questions, send them in. We're reaching the end. Uh, let's spend a little bit of time, if you don't mind, talking about the selective admissions or gifted programs, because this gets uh, a lot of attention, although it may not affect all million students. This is very important to a lot of families because it is the excellence side of a system. Um, some of these can be selective admissions. Uh, you have to test into them. They serve what some people would call the most privileged students. But the way I've always looked at it is a public school system ought to do its best to serve all kids, regardless of what they look like, where they come from, what kind of needs they have, what kind of abilities they have. There should be a portfolio of options available to all of them. And just what I've been reading, it seems that the current administration just has had a different view that almost by definition, these kind of selective schools or gifted schools are in of themselves inequitable. So what would you say to the next leaders about these um, kind of separate domain of schools that are serving particular populations that some people would say are privileged? What should the next leader do? They should expand these opportunities and reach the kids early, reach the kids early so that more of them can um, be in the situation of being in the gifted and talented programs, in the screen pro programs, and in the, in the specialized high schools. And then as more students, we have to remember that just take, for example, uh, each of these tiers, there are tens of thousands of kids who apply every year then can get into these programs. And so we should be thinking, how do we deal with that? Maybe not every, it, by by logic, not everybody can be in the top 1%, okay? That's the way it goes. But we could say that more people should be getting into the top 5%, top 10%, and have a quality education there. And that's the focus. It's not on that 1%. This was all noise. This is what I think Ian was saying about people who just want to get in front of the press and the media. You shouldn't be focusing on that 1%. You should be dealing with the 97% that are not really achieving what they should just to be on par with what standards are. So we have to bring back the standards for the gifted and talented and we stop this lottery thing. You know, this lottery thing is not about privilege. This is, is about re forgetting what the purpose of these schools are. Schools is not about lottery. If we wanted to go buy lottery, then every kid should just go and get a lottery ticket. And then uh, if you get a good lottery, you get a hundred for your grade. And if you got a lousy one, you fail. That's not the way it works. This is school folks. And so we have to get back into that assessment accountability. And that's only possible by saying that we're going to grow these options in these particular draws to the city. You know, people come into the city because they think that they could raise their families here and have options. If those options do not exist, especially in this remote work environment, they don't have to be in the city. 
if you don't provide them with good schools, why should they not, as Kathleen was saying, vote with their feet? And so we have to have these options and we have to have more of them, not fewer of them. Yeah, if, if you, if, as, as relates to the specialized high schools, if you don't like the racial makeup of the, the high schools, the answer isn't to penalize any particular group that might be overrepresented. How does that make any sense? How about building more great high schools and improving the quality of the education for the kids leading up to those exams? It's, it's this level of cynicism in the name of equity, which again, is, it's about a press release and being patting yourself on the back for saying, I'm gonna create some artificial equal representation when all you're doing is taking away opportunity from kids as opposed to expanding the pipeline and population of kids that are that have now been prepared enough to compete on an equal playing field. Yeah, I agree. It's I think just the two other things to add. I agree with everything um, that you've both said. I think one is that not every school is meant to serve every kid, but every kid is meant is to be should be able to find a school that serves their needs well. And I think that that gets kind of lost in this debate. So the specialized high schools serve a like serve a particular need, but that's not the only need, right? Um, and I think that. I think that the other thing again is just how do we how do we lift all boats? We're solving the wrong problem. If the problem is that we don't have enough, um, whether it's you know black or Hispanic students who are scoring highly or getting into the specialized high school, we need to do a better job of educating them before they get to high school. We're solving the wrong problem um, by by focusing on the the sort of the test based specialized high schools. All right, let me ask one more question before we uh, start to wrap up, and I'm gonna give you a choice uh, between these. The first is um, uh, one thing a lot of people are concerned about is uh, the expanse of what some people call critical race theory um, into a lot of different schools. And so the people who advocate for this typically say this is necessary for actually making progress on racial equality in the nation, that we need to move in this direction with curriculum and training and so forth. Other people have gone through some of this curriculum and think that it's divisive and it actually moves us backward. So a lot of school systems are taking positions on this. Do any of you have particular thoughts on how we ought to continue to make progress on issues of equality, especially related to race, especially related to income within this context that's become so big now of CRT. Any thoughts? Well, one thought, because uh, you know, critical critical race theory inspired curricula is uh, dramatically increasing across the country. And in fact, Manhattan Institute just did a study on what happens with kids when they see this content. And, and, I, and I'll read from it. Uh, in the study, they had uh, a black respondents uh, read uh, two passages, one from ta Coates, who's an author who often writes about critical race theory, and one a more neutral passage. So Coates wrote, quote, in America, it is traditional to destroy the black body. It is heritage, end quote. The other passage was more neutral. So after uh, reading these uh, questions, the two groups were asked the same statement, quote, when I make plans, I am almost certain I can make them work, end quote. With the premise that that sentence represents your belief in your own sense of agency, that you can control your own destiny. Well, the kids that read the Coates passage had a 15 percentage point lower sense of their own agency. After hearing a statement of, in America, it is traditional to destroy the black body, it is heritage. So we have to be extremely careful of what we're saying when we're, we're embedding critical race theory into curricula, because we can have the quite unintended effect of diminishing the sense of agency that particularly low-income minority kids have. So it could actually go at cross purposes with whatever the intentions are claimed to be. Uh, any other thoughts from either of you? I couldn't agree. Yeah. <laughs> I think that anybody who is serious about uh, educating and talking about what is right and moral will have to say that to increase racism, to take the route that's saying that the only way to be an anti-racist to be racist, that's wrong. You can't teach that and be right. You know, you be, by saying that we can be racist, 
that hurts everybody because it's the, the soft bigotry of low expectations for the ones who say, oh, well, you're always oppressed. To separate people into oppressor or victim class is extremely damaging for everybody. It's not only untruth and it's kind of indoctrination. It should not be taught to children because you're finding children now. It's happening right now in a school near you where the kids are coming home feeling depressed because they have been told they're either oppressor or victim. This is psychological abuse. And this is not good for their learning. It puts them in a hostile school environment where they feel that their teachers are judging them based on their race. And that is not good. This hurts everybody and we should stop it. Um, okay, well, let's spend these last couple minutes uh, just wrapping up, I want to make sure I give each of you the opportunity to, if we haven't hit something that you want to make sure that you underline, or if you want to emphasize something that we've just uh, passed over too quickly, and um, also kind of put you on the spot with this. Uh, if you were the chancellor for this next mayor, what are the things that you would prioritize? What are the things that a chancellor could get done with his or her authority without getting a new law passed as a way for people to understand what we, what should we expect of these next leaders? Obviously, they have to have a lot of meetings and go through regulatory processes. But what should we be looking for people to do to actually make progress and get back to some of the heyday of New York City as the leader of education reform? So let's go in reverse order. So Kathleen, if you want to finish up and um, the floor is yours, however you want to attack this. Um, so I guess to answer the, that second question about what would the chancellor do on day one, I'll put my superintendent hat on. I, you've explicitly said I can't talk about school choice because it's not about changing policy. So I so know that that's what I want to say, but I will not say it. I think instead we really need to get serious about uh, making sure that we're holding a high bar for teaching and learning across all New York City public schools. I think you need to get serious about curriculum selection. I think that we make the job of the teacher way too difficult when we have teachers trying to figure out what to teach day in and day out and are not given the tools and resources in the form of a really well-developed, coherently aligned, standards-aligned curriculum that meets kids where they are and gets them where they need to go. And so I think first day one is making sure that we have are aligned on which curricula meet those standards and making sure that school leaders and teachers have access to those materials. Um, I think also really taking seriously the role of assessment in kind of school, not just school's oversight, but in terms of meeting kids where they are and getting them where they need to, where they need to go. I think that's something that's been really sorely missing from the de Blasio administration is a commitment to external benchmarks and external assessments, which I think are, at, they don't need to have consequences for kids, but they need to be there to understand what kids need. Perfect, thank you. Uh, Ian. Uh, well, you know, again, as a as a product of the New York City public school system myself, K to twelve, I know what is possible. I know it's possible to get an incredible education. I got it. Millions of other kids have received it, and so we need a chancellor who can speak in that inspiring uh, fashion, who can speak about the possibility. And I will go back to choice, even though you're banning us from saying it, because no, you can't go ahead. It's fundamental. It, it's fundamental, you know, if a parent, uh, if you want to give parents power, give them the power to not go to the school that they're zoned for. And then you might actually see some real change happen. And without that, you, you, you know, you're, you're already tying two, two of your, uh, you know, arms behind you. And so we're, we're maybe a broken record on this point, but it's fundamental to giving kids and parents equal opportunity. And that's all that parents want. They want a fair shot for their kids. Well said. Weiwa, bring us home. I think our next chancellor should focus on the kids. Listen to their families, their parents, and the community, and get their education level up. Take a temperature, as Kathleen was saying too, you have to have an assessment if they're running at 103 degrees, okay? They have to know what it is, how sick it is, and then say, we're going to get it down to what level as soon as possible. Have your milestones and get there. That's fantastic. Thank you. And I hope all of you are on the short list for being the next chancellor of New York City uh, 
uh, public schools. Um, let's hope that something like that happens. Well, uh, thank you for taking the time to be a part of this. Uh, we've reached the end of the hour. Um, I think this has just been terrific. Uh, I'm indebted to all of you for um, taking part. And more broadly, this just closes the Manhattan Institute's um, New York City Reborn uh, virtual summit that's been going on this week. Uh, thank you for joining us this entire week as we've discussed the future of the Big Apple. Um, the pandemic and subsequent economic crisis really challenged the city, but uh, Gotham is going to make a comeback. And the Manhattan Institute, its reason for being is to make sure that we can help lead that change um, and uh, provide as much support to those who are like-minded and want to make sure that this great city can bounce back uh, as high as possible. Now, if you want to learn more about the Manhattan Institute, and please do, um, especially the New York City Reborn Initiative, and you can also read the policy playbook for the next mayor. Uh, all of that should be, uh, you should find the links for that on your screen right now. And if you're able, please consider giving um, to the Institute. We need your support. People like you enable the Manhattan Institute, which is a non profit organization. Uh, your support enables us to do this kind of work and continue to advance great ideas for great locations like uh, New York City. So with that, I hope everyone has a great weekend. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, we hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.